So this is how Easter began, according to Luke in his gospel. In in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, this is how he starts Easter morning. He says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning. Have you been there? I think you have. I mean, all of us have, really. The first day of the week, very early in the morning. That means that the previous week has already ended. We've closed the chapter on what has happened in the past week. What's been done has been done. It's old news. It's yesterday. It's over. And and so now we find ourselves in the first hours of the first day of the new week. And it's a clean slate. And we have the the charge that that is given to us that, that Paul took upon himself that we are to forget what lies behind and to press on toward the mark that God has set before us. And that is exactly what I believe the women were doing that first morning, that Easter morning when they got up early in the morning on the first day of the week to walk to the empty tomb. They had spices in their hand. And what I am confident they were trying to do as they made their way toward that tomb, I'm sure they were trying to forget. I'm sure they were trying to forget what they experienced on Friday, just two days before that morning. I mean, they had seen it all. They had seen a horrific crucifixion. They had seen their Savior's broken and bloodied body nailed to a cross. They heard the deafening thud as that cross was raised in its upright position and dropped in a hole. They heard his cries of anguish. They saw the crowd mocking him and spitting on him. They saw the blood drops fall from his hands and his feet. And they witnessed him as he he garnered his very last bit of energy to say to his father regarding those who were standing around the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And then they heard him as he said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And they watched him breathe his last. They'd seen all of that. And I'm sure as they were walking toward that tomb that morning to place spices on his body, I'm sure they were trying to forget it all. You've been there, haven't you? Trying to forget. Trying to forget yesterday's fear. And yesterday's pain, yesterday's abuse, trying to forget yesterday's grief. I mean, you, you've, you've tried to forget yesterday's confusion, haven't you? I'm sure you've been at that place where you've tried to forget yesterday's unfulfilled expectations and, and yesterday's pain. I'm sure that's what they were trying to do that day, just trying to forget it all. You see, they buried him in a hurry on that Friday because the Passover was about to begin as soon as the sun set. And so they had to bury him quickly. So they wrapped his body in linen cloths and they laid him on a slab in a rich man's tomb. And a stone was rolled in front of the opening to that tomb to seal it shut. And then on the third day after Jesus died, which was As the scripture says, the first day of the week, very early in the morning, these women took spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they didn't find the body of their Lord Jesus. And the Bible says, while they were perplexed about this, I love that line. While they were perplexed, you bet they were perplexed, don't you think? I mean, I mean, they walked to that tomb. They were expecting to see his body there and they saw his body wasn't there and they were They were perplexed by this. It's interesting, though. I mean, they had heard him teach for three years. And and over the course of those three years, they'd heard him say on several occasions that, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and by the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. They had heard him say that not once or twice. They heard him say that on several occasions. And it doesn't get much clearer than that, does it? But now... But now with Friday's darkness clouding their vision, 
I'm sure all they could think about was his beaten, bloody body that they were going to anoint with the spices that they held in their hands. So when Luke says that they were perplexed, I, uh, I get it. Because what they were looking for, what they expected to see, was his lifeless body lying in that tomb. This was going to be the moment when they would be able to pay their final respects to this one that they called Lord and Savior. And if you've ever been to a funeral home to, uh, to a, a visitation time for a friend or a loved one who's lying in a casket, you know how they felt as they were about to walk into that darkened tomb. The only thing is, when they stepped into that tomb, his body wasn't there. And so while they were perplexed about this, the scripture says, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. That is Easter's declaration. He is not here. He's risen. And so they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Which leads me to ask you this question this morning. What are you looking for today? What are you looking for today? What have you been looking lately? What have you been looking for lately with respect to your life as a follower of Jesus? Have you been looking for anything? I tell you, sometimes I wonder these days if Christians are looking for anything outside of being protected and safe and secure. A year spent in a pandemic will do that to you, you know. I mean, every single one of us knows the power of fear. We've been in its grip more times than we can count over the last year. It can lock you down. Fear. It certainly did with the disciples. I mean, you notice who it was that walked to the tomb early that morning. It wasn't the disciples. You know who it was? It was the women. You know where the disciples were? They were in their homes. In fact, it says later in this same chapter, it says later in the day, they would be, they would, they would be behind locked doors because they were afraid. But then Luke tells us that on the other side of those locked doors, all of a sudden, Jesus was standing among them. Which makes me ask this question, I wonder, is it possible that God wants to do a resurrection work in all of our lives this Easter season? Do you think that might be the case? I will tell you that it's not going to be easy to receive this Easter blessing, this resurrection work that he wants to do in our lives. It's going to be difficult to even consider um, embracing Easter's breakthrough in your life for that matter. But, But I know, I know that he wants more from us right now. You see, I believe that with all my heart that our world needs more Christians, more from Christians right now than it's getting. It needs so much more from Christians than it's getting right now. Because our culture, our Our country, I believe, desperately needs an Easter revival. And that is not a political statement. That is, as I see it, just plain fact. I mean, just this past week, you've seen the news, perhaps. The the rapper Little Nas X, he he, uh, had some shoes made. He took some Nike shoes and had a satanic pentagram put on those shoes with one drop of human blood in the soles of those shoes. And they made only 666 pairs of these shoes. And the the news tells us that those shoes sold out in less than a a few minutes for over $1,000 a pair. Our world needs to hear from Christians today. And so what I truly believe is that this Easter revival that I'm talking about, this Easter revival begins right here today with you and me on Easter Sunday, April the 4th, 2021. And as we worship here, with our eyes on Good Friday's cross and on Easter's empty tomb, I want to declare to you that Jesus did all of this. He went through all of this for you. 
Over the last six weeks, we've talked about some pretty heavy subjects in here as we've talked about how the blood of Jesus makes its way through the entire biblical witness. But every one of those messages has landed on this singular truth, and that is that God loves you beyond measure. And he wants more than anything for us to know his love and to be filled with his love today, tomorrow, and forever. And to prove his love for us, or as the scripture says in Romans 5, 8, God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died for you, not because you were perfect. Jesus died for you, not because you finally got it all right. Jesus died for you, not because you finally got to that place in your life where you, you aren't being tripped up by that same old sin that's gotten to you day after day, week after week, year after year. No, Jesus died for you while you were still a sinner. And that proves God's love for you. That proves his love. And that's what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about today. I want to talk about you and I want to talk about me. I want to talk about how all of this impacts our lives right now, right where we live in this COVID-19 filled, culturally confused, divided world that we are in right now. And I want to talk about how we can be a part of an Easter revival that God wants to do in every one of our hearts and in our community and in our world today. And to do that, I want to share a word from another book in the Bible. It's a, it's a letter that was written to the church in Ephesus. And, and in this section of the book of Ephesians, I want to share a passage of Scripture that speaks to the power of Jesus' death and resurrection over our lives. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 4. He says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. And so we praise God for the glorious grace that he's poured out onto us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. And I also pray, he says, that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. It is a powerful word that speaks about God's God's power over our lives through the death and the resurrection of his son. And so the rest of my message today can really be summed up in, in, in three phrases, four words, three phrases, chosen, forgiven, and set free. Chosen, forgiven, and set free. Let's talk about chosen first. It says in Ephesians 1, 4, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. He chose you. But I, what I want you to understand here is that God chose you long before you chose him. Do you get that? God chose you before you chose him. It says even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ. God chose you, not because you were smart. He chose you not because you have something that he needs. He chose you not because you're talented or athletic or gifted in any particular way. God chose you because he loves you. And he chose you before you ever even thought about choosing him. God said to the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. David wrote in Psalm 139, he said, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. So this is the way God set it all up. Before he made anything, before he made anything, he chose us and he loved us and he created us to be holy and blameless and without fault in his eyes. He, in his plan, and he worked out this plan, his plan was to make us into fearfully and wonderfully made people fashioned in his image. And because he loved us, 
He decided long in advance, as it says in Ephesians, to adopt us into his family. This has always been his plan. Since before any of us ever took our first breath, this was his plan. And you know, it all sounds like a nice fairy tale that that God made me in his image and he he gave me all that I need to be, all that he he made me to be. And he loved me enough that he wants me to be in his family forever. And that sounds just perfect. I mean, what better setup for a wonderful life than that? The only problem is that we mess it up. We mess it up all the time. We mess it up because of the way we treat all that God has given us. He's given us minds. He's given us bodies. He's given us souls. And we corrupt our minds and our bodies and souls by all the things that we put in them. Because at some point, what we put in is going to come out. I said last week that it's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. What you put in your heart is going to come out at some point. The Bible calls this sin. And we all sin. Sometimes it's unconscious. Sometimes we don't know we're sinning when we're sinning. But I think if we were to all be real honest with ourselves, we'd have to confess that most of the time we know exactly what we're doing when we're sinning. When we're talking about that person behind their back, we know what we're doing when we're doing it. When we step over the line just a little bit, that line that we know is the line that divides right and wrong. When we step over that line, even if it's just getting a toe over the line, we know what we're doing when we do it. When we do something that goes against what it is that God desires us to do, we know we're doing it when we do it. And as we talked about extensively over the last six weeks, it's the sin in our lives that separates us from God. It's the sin in our lives that that prevents us from living into that fearfully and wonderfully made man and woman that he's made us to be. But listen to this. Even my sin, even your sin, doesn't disqualify you from being chosen by God. He chose you before you sin. He's choosing you while you sin, and he will continue to choose you after you sin. Why? Because he loves you. And because he loves you and because he knows that you sin, just like everybody else around you, because he loves you and because he knows of your sin, he sent his one and only son to die on a cross so that your sin could be taken care of and you could be, and here's the second word, forgiven. Forgiven. Jesus' blood was shed so that your sin would be forgiven. And that blood knows no distinction. His precious blood was shed for you. But maybe you're sitting there listening to what I'm saying and you're thinking, there is no way that he could forgive what I've done in my life. You may be thinking there's no way that he could forgive what I said to her the other day. You may be thinking there's no way he could forgive what I did to him. You may be thinking there's no way that God could forgive the time I cheated all those years ago. You may be thinking there's no way because of what you've done in your life that God could forgive you. And so you've just been living with it for a long, long, long time. It's like a weight on your shoulders. Well, I I like what Tim Keller says. He says that the good news of Christianity is that you are worse than you think and you are loved by God more than you believe. Think about that. You are worse than you think, and you are loved by God more than you can believe. You see, I think the most difficult step that any of us will ever take during the course of our lives is that step into the truth about ourselves that we really are worse than we think we are. You see, until we take that step, until we take that step into the truth about ourselves that that accepts the, the reality that we really are worse than we think we are, until we take that step into the truth about ourselves that we sin and we fall short of the glory of God, and until we recognize that that sin in our lives separates us from God, we'll never recognize our deep need for a Savior. And we will never comprehend the magnitude of God's love for us. Remember what Jesus said? 
He said, God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him will never die but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but God sent his son into the world to save the world. God sent his son into the world to remind you and me that we are a part of his family. God sent his son into the world to, to prove the depth of his amazing love for every single one of us. God sent his son into the world to be that once and for all atoning sacrifice for our sins so that because of Jesus, because of Jesus, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees his son. Ephesians 1, 7 says that God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. I mean, he loved you and chose you to be a part of his family. He saw your sin, so he sent his son to die so that your sin would be forgiven. So he chose you. And he forgave you. And finally, because you have been chosen and because of, of the work that his son did that allowed you to be, be forgiven, because of both of those things, because you're chosen and because you are forgiven, you have been set free. Set free. Free from condemnation. Free from shame. Free from all in your life that is held down by the sin that weighs you down. I see so many people walking around carrying so much baggage on their shoulders because of the sin in their life. Because of all that they've, they've experienced in their life that they believe can't be taken care of by a holy God. And so they go around just carrying this with them day after day after day. And it weighs them down because they find, and they finally get to a point where they just say, I'm just going to live with this for the rest of my life. Well, I want to tell you, you don't have to live that way anymore. Because our God, through Jesus Christ, has set you free. I love what the Bible says in Romans 6. Paul says, thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, now you've been set free from sin and you've become slaves to righteousness. Set free. Do you get that? Do you get that? Listen, just, Jesus didn't just come into this world to improve your life and to make you into a better person. Although I, I think that's what a lot of people think Christianity is all about. It's just about going through some kind of moral boot camp. Yeah, you learn this, you learn that, and, and after you've gotten to the end of whatever it is you're supposed to learn, you'll become a better person. And once you get to that place where you're comfortable with all that, that God has, has done in your life, when you get to that place where you think he's done enough for me, then you just sort of settle down, you gather some people around yourself, you kick your feet up, and you just coast your way into heaven. I've known so many people over the, 30 years of my ministry, good people, Christians. But they reach a certain point in time in their life and in the time that they've spent in the church and they just get to a place where they think, you know, I'm, I'm just done. I don't need to grow anymore in my, my understanding of, of who I am as a child of God. I don't need to grow any closer to Jesus in my, my relationship to him. They just get to that comfortable place and they, they decide to press the cruise control button and just let it rise. I want to tell you, Jesus didn't die for that. His precious blood wasn't shed for that. Jesus came and he lived and he suffered and he died and God brought him back to life for a reason. He came to this world to cancel the debt that you owe God because of your sin. Jesus came to bring you out of the darkness and stand you up in the midst of his marvelous light. Jesus came to give you an unshakable hope. Jesus came to bring dead people to life. And I want to tell you, no matter what Satan might try to do to undo all that God has done in your life through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I got to tell you right now, you have within you through the Holy Spirit a blood-borne power that absolutely cannot be conquered. 
And God wants to use that power today to bring revival. I'm going to tell you, when you actually come to grips with the magnitude of this power that God wants to unleash in your life, you'll realize that on Easter Sunday, we ought to be wearing crash helmets rather than Easter bonnets to church, you know? I got to tell you, somewhere in the, 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 the deep forest of the Christian life, there's a fork in the path. And, and some people take one pathway off of that fork and and it's kind of a comfortable path. It's a pathway that doesn't really require any risk. It doesn't really require any faith to walk along that path. It's a path that really, I guess you'd just say, it leads to rest and relaxation and retirement from the rigors of living as salt and light in the world today. And there are a lot of people who take that path. But then there's the other path at that fork, that, that, that people who travel on that other path, they discover that there are some twists and turns on, along that path that, that kind of catch you by surprise. There are, some, there are some, some places along that path that are so difficult to, to pass through that some people might be inclined to turn around and go back where they started and, and make their way rather down that, that more comfortable path. But I will tell you this, the person who walks down that path with their eyes on the one who created that path recognizes that that pathway is a pathway that where miracles still happen and life is full and rich and overflowing with the presence of the power of God. And I believe today on this Easter Sunday, our resurrected Christ stands at that fork in the road and he's pointing us down that second path. And if the, if the good news of Easter is true, then it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we that we really have been set free. And it's because of that fact that we've been set free that we have hope, real hope that allows us to be overcomers in life no matter how dark our lives might become. Do you want that hope today? It's not outside of your reach. It's not. Several years ago, there was a teacher who accepted a volunteer position um, at a hospital in a, in a big city. And this uh, volunteer position was to visit um, students who were in the hospital and help them with their classwork while they were there in the hospital. And one day, this, uh, this lady who volunteered to, to be a hospital teacher got her first call, her first opportunity to to fulfill this role that she had volunteered for. And so she took down the room number uh, of the, the patient that was there and, and she started, uh, she listened to, to what the supervising nurse told her. The nurse told her that, um, that this, this boy's teacher said that he had been working on nouns and adverbs while he was in school. And so uh, she happened to have been a grammar teacher. And so this was right up her alley. And so she prepared herself before she went in to, to teach him about nouns and adverbs what she didn't realize until she got just outside his door was that this patient that she'd been assigned to was a patient in the hospital's burn unit. She was prepared to teach English grammar, but she wasn't prepared to witness the horrible look and the smell of badly burned flesh. She also wasn't prepared to see a child in so much pain. She walked in that hospital room and the smell was so bad she wanted to, to pinch her nose. She wanted to turn away. She really wanted to walk out as quickly as she walked in, but, but the Lord wouldn't allow her to do it. And so she walked up to this boy's bedside and she said, hello, I'm your hospital teacher and uh, I'm here to teach you about nouns and adverbs. And they spent the next... 30 minutes talking about nouns and adverbs, and then she left. The next day, she came to the hospital, and she met the supervising nurse, and, and the supervising nurse said to her, what did you do to that boy yesterday? And this, this teacher started apologizing because she felt she was certain that she 
did something wrong. She was certain that she did something that she wasn't supposed to do. And, and she just started kind of stammering all over herself, apologizing for whatever it is that she might have done wrong. And the nurse said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You need to listen to me. She said, you don't understand. We've been really worried about this boy. He's not responded to anything that we've done. He's, his condition has just been deteriorating day after day. We thought he was going to die. But ever since you were with him yesterday, his whole attitude has changed. He's responding to treatment now. We believe he's going to live. And that nurse later that day went and talked with this boy. And she asked him herself, she said, what was it that happened yesterday with that teacher? And, and the boy said, I figured I was doomed, that I was going to die. And then as a tear rolled down his cheek. He said, but when I saw her, I realized that they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dead boy. Hope. Hope. That's what our world needs today more than anything. It needs hope. And you can be a deliverer of that hope. Do you believe it? I do. You know why? I believe that you and I can be deliverers of this hope because we've been chosen by a God who loves you beyond measure. And not only have you been chosen by a God who loves you beyond measure, you've been forgiven through his son's precious blood that was shed for you. And not only have you been chosen, and not only have you been forgiven, but you, because of his resurrection, you have been set free. Chosen, forgiven, set free. That's what's happened with all of us. You've been chosen, you've been forgiven, you've been set free. Say that with me. Chosen, forgiven, set free. Say it again. Chosen, forgiven, set free. Say it one more time. Chosen, forgiven, set free. That's what Easter declares over each of us today. We've been chosen. We've been forgiven. We've been set free. And now the opportunity is before us to live out that freedom, that chosenness, that forgiveness to bring revival in this land. Let's pray.